All right, everyone. So we're going to get started. Now, before I dive in, there is a lot of information on these slides on purpose, and I put those in your notes. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things, highlight a couple of examples. And then basically what we'll do is once you've watched this video and filled out the notes, we'll talk about it in the quick writes, and then I can uh, answer any questions for things that you weren't able to understand or things that were a little bit confusing. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the purpose of this. It's just to give you a basic understanding of credit, of borrowing. What does it mean to take out a loan? What does it mean to have this 735 credit score that you're seeing right here? So that's what we're going to dive, dive into. So first of all, what is credit? Well, ultimately, what you're saying is you're establishing trust. And you are saying, if you lend me $1,000, I will pay it back. And ultimately it's in a certain amount of time. And ultimately, how do we establish trust? Uh, a lot of it is with, with credit scores uh, in our society, but also when you look, look at this too, you will look at the amount of interest paid. And so if you are more trustworthy in paying things back, you will likely pay less in interest. And then also when you look at taking out a loan, the sooner you pay it back, the less money over time that you will pay. And so, like I said, it's this trust that you're, you're establishing here. And so if you take out a student loan for $10,000, you know, how, how many uh, years are you going to take to pay that back? If you take 10 years, you're going to pay less over the 10 years than if you were to take like 15 years. And same thing if you were to drop a lump sum of money uh, paying back uh, that balance, that could, that could make a, a definite impact as well. And then when you have a credit card, we'll get into those specifically too, is you're basically making a loan uh, over a one month span. And if you don't pay off your credit card balance, you have to pay interest. Um, and we'll talk about a number of other fees that they'll pile on too. So when you have credit, you are establishing this trust, quote unquote, with someone or with a company. So if you're, if you have like your family loans you money, they may not charge you interest to pay it back, but they would be the creditor. They're the one whom the debt is being owed. You have to pay the money back to them. The creditor could also be a bank. Creditor could be MasterCard. The creditor could be uh, the federal government if you're taking out a student loan. And so the creditor is really just who you're paying the money back to. So what are, why, why would you need credit? What would be some, some benefits? Well, in our society, you really do need to have credit if you're going to, um, I don't know, do, do a lot of these, these different ideas. So like getting a job, you have to be able to establish credit. Buying a home, they're gonna check your credit because if you're buying a home, they want to make sure, okay, are you good with your money? Are you trustworthy with the amount of money that is being lent to you? Getting a credit card, you know, even when you look at like going to Costco, you can't get the Costco credit card unless you have a current credit score. And so even for you guys starting out uh, trying to establish credit, you may not qualify yet for, for something like the Costco Visa card. Uh, same thing with renting an apartment. When a, when a landlord is trying to approve or or not approve your application, they're gonna look at, okay, how, how trustworthy are you with, with lending money, uh, paying it back? And then same thing with getting a car. If you wanna um, buy a car, you, you need to be able to get a loan unless you have cash to pay the entire balance on the spot. And so ultimately, based on your credit score, we can see how trustworthy are you. And then also understand that there are many consequences for, for not paying things back and not paying it um, on time. And so when you have these loans, you have to pay interest if it takes you longer to pay them back. And so the difficulty oftentimes, especially with a credit card, is you know you just swipe your credit card or you enter in the chip and then you don't, you don't really have to worry about it. You buy it and then you'll pay it back later, but what happens if later does it come? And so ultimately a lot of people can get into this cycle of debt where they just take out too much, they use their credit cards too much, um, and then ultimately you will have a poor credit score and then when you're trying to get a car or get a nicer home and these things become very, very difficult. So as a borrower, when you are taking out money, only take out what you can pay back. And I know that sounds very basic, but that's, 
that's really the name of the game. And even we'll talk about credit card strategies too. When I was in college, I used my credit card for things that I already had cash for. So I would get gas in my car and then I would immediately pay off the credit card. I established credit, but I don't have to worry about paying any fees or interest because I immediately pay it off because I only charged the amount of cash that I already had. And then even understanding what you're signing up for, we'll look at the different um, specs that you wanna look for when signing up for a credit card and student loans. And then it's really important that if you cannot pay your debts, you can oftentimes go into what's called forbearance, but you have to let the creditor know about this. And so this is something we'll talk about maybe more with student loans. So how do you get credit? For most of you guys, you may not have credit. That doesn't mean you have a zero credit score. It just means you have not established any credit. So basically what you can do is you can get your own credit card, um, but oftentimes you'll need a co-signer. And a co-signer means if I sign up for a credit card um, and I need my mom to co-sign it, if I can't pay the debt, my mom will pay the debt and they'll hound her if I can't pay the debt. And that's what a co-signer is. So you can co-sign a lease um, with an apartment. And that means that if you cannot pay the debt, if your mom co-signs the lease, then they'll, then they'll get the money from, from your mother. And so when you're establishing an account, that could be a way to establish credit. I know that's how I got a credit card when I turned 18, is my, my mom co-signed for it. She never needed to pay my debts. You know, I was able to cover it. But then once I established that credit, I could get a better credit card on my own. And really, you want to show that you can, you can do it responsibly for a year. So I mentioned with, um, with, with my credit card, I would buy gas or I would buy groceries, and then I would immediately pay it off with cash I had in my checking account. And so really, you want to be paying your bills on time. And, and uh, all these things are tracked um, by credit, uh, credit score companies, which we'll get into as well. So here's where you can get credit from. Banks have, have loans. You can get like a retail store, credit card. Um, you, you have all these different places where you can get the credit from. And even like a credit union, this too is just um, giving out um, loans and things like that. And, and ultimately, these are ways that you can establish credit to demonstrate to these entities uh, that you are trustworthy with money that is being loaned to you. So a couple of things you want to know, you want to be an informed purchaser. You want to make sure that you know what you're, you're getting yourself into. And so one thing you want to do when you're looking at these different purchases is if you're going to be getting into debt and you're going to pay it off eventually, you want to make sure that you are in fact getting the best deal. So make sure you shop around um, the best loan, the best credit card that fits your situation. Uh, do you feel that you were pressured? into taking that that loan or that credit card so this is oftentimes when you go to like a retail store and they get kind of pushy with the with the card that they want you to sign up for i mean that could be something maybe that's not such a good time for you to decide maybe you want to go home and think about it type of idea uh, and then do you understand what you're signing up for what is the apr what is the annual uh, rate what is there an annual fee that you have to pay and ultimately you need to know the different lending terms ultimately so you know can you actually pay this back but you can only answer that question if you're informed enough about the actual loan itself so yeah so if it says if the answer is no except for two then wait wait to make the purchase so a couple of things. I know this is a lot, a lot on this page, but uh, these are terms that we will go over more specifically when we do our credit card activity. But in a nutshell, these are a good, uh, like a good rundown of things that you want to look for. So think of it as a checklist of when you're thinking, okay, do I want to open this student loan? Do I want to get this credit card? These are the things that you want to look for and basically compare and contrast. So the annual fee. So Basically, if you have um, a credit card, you may have to actually pay $100 a year just to have that credit card. Or even, you know, like an American Express black card, you have to be spending a certain amount of money each year even to have that credit card, things like that. The APR, which we'll get into more later, this is where you talk about if you take the principal of the loan, so the amount of money that you owe. So let's say you owe $10,000 and, um, the interest rate is uh, 
So you owe your APR is whatever you owe. So in this case, you owe 10,000 plus the 2% interest rate. That's your APR. Let's say you pay off a lot of that loan. So it's $5,000 plus the 2%. It's a lower um, APR. And so you want to know what, what that, that rate would be. So it's basically what is the, the cost of having that loan per year? I know that's kind of complicated. Like I said, we'll get into more of this when we look at uh, comparing these numbers with credit cards. You also want to know when your payments are due. When you take out a student loan, you may, you may be able to not have to pay that loan until after you graduate. Some loans start accruing interest while you're still in college. Some don't accrue interest until after you graduate. And so that's something to understand. And then when you talk about a minimum payment, this is more related to uh, credit cards, but if you make the minimum payment, um, that ultimately is going to keep you in debt for a very long time. Now, with the grace period, this is what I'm talking about with the student loan. You may not have to pay it till after you graduate. And then ultimately, you're, you're going to look at other fees that are included in this, in this loan agreement. And the credit card is a loan agreement as well. And so you really want to make sure what happens. And even if something goes wrong and you're not able to make a payment, what do you have to pay if you miss the payment? So sometimes you may not get the loan that you want. Sometimes you sign up for a credit card or you request uh, a credit card and they say, no, sorry, can't, can't give you this credit card. It's, you may not have any credit history. This is most likely what you guys are is the first bullet point. Or you may just have too much debt. Or they can see based on the amount of money that you make compared to the amount of spending that you do, you have too much debt. We cannot trust you. Um, but oftentimes, and this is why... Um, when you talk about someone's identity being stolen, if you're a victim of this, this fraud, ultimately it's still going to show up on your credit score. Um, and that's really something that's, that's very difficult. Uh, also, if you declare bankruptcy is also something that can be denied credits. So let's look at two examples real quick. So you look at good credit. Okay. So someone who has uh, really good credits, they are going to have a five-year loan car loan, and they're gonna pay $377 a month at 4.97% interest. And so they're gonna pay 377. And so each month, they're gonna to have to pay an interest rate on that, but ultimately it's 377 because the interest rate is pretty low compared to this one, $514 a month at 18.56% interest you are not trusted. So this person down here is not trustworthy, which is why they're given such a high interest rate. The bank feels they can trust you if, if they charge you this amount of money where they're saying to this guy, well, ultimately you have good credit. You're trustworthy with paying things back. So we're only gonna charge you this amount of interest. So interest is the way that we measure the trust. If you are very trustworthy, the interest rate will be low. If you are not trustworthy, the interest rate will be very high. Now, one final thing about this component is you want to make sure that based on the amount of income you have, so the amount of money that you're making, you don't want more debt than the amount of income. And so if you look down here, the 15%, what that means is based on the amount of money you make. So if you make $100,000, you shouldn't have any more than $15,000 in debt. So like up here, if you make $100,000 a year, you have $50,000 in debt. That's, that's really not, not a, a good thing. So with credit cards. More specifically, how much does it cost to have a credit card? Well, it's, it depends on how much you are using it and then how long it takes you to, to pay it back. So if you look at the example below, you have a balance of $500 and ultimately you only need to pay 20, right? That's the minimum, minimum payment that, that you need to make. And so ultimately this is a way for the credit card to kind of hook you in and say, well, you only need to pay that amount and then don't worry about it. But ultimately what this is doing is you are allowing more and more time to pass before you're paying off the entire 500. And so there's going to be more interest that comes in here. And so if you just pay the $20, it's going to take you two and a half years uh, to pay this, to pay this back. And ultimately you're going to end up paying $600 
and this is an extra $100 on top of the $500 you borrowed. Had you just paid it back, it would have cost you $500. But if you only make the minimum, you're going to pay an extra $100. If you have a balance of 1000 and you make the minimum payment, you're going to end up paying an extra $500. And if you have a $2,500 balance and you pay the minimum, you're going to end up paying an extra $2,300. And so this is definitely a strategy known by the credit card companies. And I would really encourage you that you would always want to pay off only, or you only want to use a credit card when you can pay it off completely. But if you cannot, you definitely want to make much, much more than the monthly, first monthly payment, the minimum payment. Never want to just pay the minimum payment. You have to pay more, otherwise you'll be stuck. So looking at credit report, and so a credit report ultimately is showing, it's like a portfolio. It's like a folder of all of your lending, borrowing uh, things. And so this could be the, like for, for myself, for example, I have student loans, I have one credit card, um, I have a car loan. And so ultimately these are things that would be in my credit report. And so these uh, credit reporting bureaus Equifax, TransUnion, Experian, maybe you've heard of these. I know like uh, I went to a Dodger game and they had a giveaway. It was a sponsored by Experian or Equifax. And basically they are the ones that collect this, this information. And so if you go and you want to apply for a car loan, basically they would ask for your credit report and the credit report would bring back all this information. And then the bank can say, yeah, we don't really trust you with this money. So here is a 30% interest rate. That's the level of trust that we can, we can establish. Now, the credit reporting bureaus will also establish what's called a credit score. So it's basically just a number that will show you, okay, so how trustworthy are you? And so I think of it as kind of like a GPA. And so, um, actually, before we do that, so your credit score, so if it's, it's uh, closer to, you know, six, 600 is kind of in the middle. Anything below, like 500 is, is considered poor. And then really anything above 700, between 700 and 800 is, is about as high as it can get. And that's really excellent, excellent credits. Okay, so we actually went over this, but these are just things that, that the credit reporting bureaus will collect. Um, but I kind of went over that in the last slide, so we're going to move on. Another thing, so, so when you look at your, your score, and one example of the credit score, one that is most likely used is this company, Fair and Isaac Company or corporation, it's called a FICO, FICO score. There is no zero, so if you don't have credit, you, there's no zero, you just don't have credit, but like the minimum score you could have is a 300. It's really poor. That's, that's really, the 300 means, wow, we really can't trust you with any type of loan, whereas an 850, which you really don't see actually that high, you really maybe see 800 as a max, but 800 is excellent credit. We will give you the best loan we can offer um, and so ultimately this company, they, they create these scores and everyone who has taken out a loan, co-signed on a loan, they will have all this information based on um, this score and the score is made based on your credit report. So to say that a different way, your credit score is generated based on your credit report and your credit report includes all your past payments on time and late payments, any balance, anything they can find in public records, any sort of loan credit established. Okay, so what do they look at? Your credit score, okay, most of it is your payment history. Did you pay it back? They'll also look at what types of loans are you taking out? So for my case, credit card, student loan, car loan, um, any requests for new credit. Are you signing up for a ton of credit cards? That may be a red flag. And then length of credit history. How long did you take out the loan? How long did it take you to pay it back? And then also just the, the raw number of how much, how much debt you have in, in a, a monetary amount. And so you add this all up and this is how the credit score is established. You could say this in a different way. This is the algorithm that's used um, by FICO uh, to establish your score. So just kind of um, breaking this down into a couple of key tips. You always, when it says the total price, you wanna make sure what are you paying? So if it's 500, you're charging with your credit card, what is that plus the interest? 
how many months are you planning on using to pay that money back? You never want to pay the minimum. You always want to pay more than that as large amount as you can um, and maybe even double the minimum. And then you also want to look at the penalties. What if you miss a payment? Um, so not even giving like less than the minimum, but also just missing it completely. And then also understand that uh, you just don't want to pay the minimum. This is don't think that the small payments are the best option. You will pay more in the long run. Very good. So I'm just going to go over a couple of student loan terms very quickly. I know this is super riveting, but I appreciate you guys uh, hanging in. I just want to give this, this brief overview, um, especially with things going, going forward. Many of you guys are going to be taking out student loans next year or the year after. So let's look at this real quick. So how do you get a student loan? Well, you got to fill up the FAFSA. So the FAFSA is from the federal government and it's a form that says, okay, your family makes this amount of money and based on that amount of money, we as the federal government feel your family can contribute X amount of dollars. So if your family makes uh, $100,000 a year, uh, the FAFSA form will be filled out and they'll have your family's tax IRS information so they'll know how much money they make and they'll punch it into their uh, their formula down here and they'll say, okay, well, your family makes 100,000. We think that you can pay 50,000 a year. And so your need based, we figure is you can take out 50,000 in loans. Now, what that means is you don't need 50,000 in loans. You may only need $10,000 in student loans. So only take out 10,000. FAFSA will tell you the federal government says you are allowed to take this amount of money out in student loans. Now, you still have to pay it back. They may say that you're eligible for $100,000 in student loans a year. You don't want to take that money and then go on vacation. You really only want to take exactly the amount that you need. But basically, you have to fill out this form, you have to fill it out every year. Even in my grad program, I, I have to fill it out every year to get student loans for that. So that's just what that's looking at is how much money do you actually need and the federal government has a form for that. Then there's what you are expected to pay. Now the expected family contribution is always seems to be an outrageous number, which is just your family can contribute like $30,000 out of pocket. Well, I don't know where that money is coming from, but ultimately they'll give you that. They'll give you what your need is and then what your family should be expected to pay. And ultimately you'll see this, and hopefully some of you guys have seen this on a portal if you've been accepted to a school, they give you your SAR, your student award report. So your student award report will say, okay, so based on filling out the FAFSA, your award, we will award you $50,000 in loans if you would like to take that out. And now what happens is the federal government, they will actually give the form to your school. So let's say that you're going to uh, Cal State Northridge you fill out the FAFSA form and then Cal State Northridge will give you your SAR. Um, or if you're going to UC Irvine, you fill out the FAFSA, then UCI will say, okay, based on your FAFSA, we're gonna give you this amount of uh, student loans that you can take out and then ultimately we're gonna give you this scholarship and all that type of thing. But it's all based on filling out this one form with the federal government. Awesome, so uh, different than loans, but similar kind of concept is a grant is like a gift. It's a, an amount of money that you are given for school, but you don't have to pay it back. A loan, you have to pay back. Grants are, here is $100, uh, or like here's $1,000, or a couple thousand dollars paid towards your tuition, and this is usually like a Pell Grant. It's usually given for students who are lower socioeconomic level, and so it's an equity opportunity. So basically saying, because your family cannot contribute as much, the federal government is gonna pay $1,000 of your tuition to ensure that you can go to school and hopefully the finances wouldn't prevent you from going. Um, again, usually are those that uh, are lower socioeconomic level, but grants are awesome. Grants you do not need to, uh, to pay back. A Couple of other terms, almost done here. So if you take out a student loan, you can take out a subsidized loan or you can have an unsubsidized loan. So what does that mean? Subsidized means that the government is gonna pay your interest when you're in school. 
So let's say it takes you five years to graduate. I don't know, just use an example. If it takes you five years and you take out a loan your freshman year, your first year of college, the federal government, if you have a subsidized loan, the federal government's gonna pay your interest in those five years that you're in school. And then once you graduate, then they're going to uh, uh, have you pay the interest. So again, usually only if you're a low socioeconomic level, but also subsidized loans give a grace period. So it takes four years to graduate college. During that time, those four years, the government's gonna pay the interest. And then once you graduate, let's say you graduate May, 2020, well, then you have six months. You have until the end of the year that you have to start paying interest. And so that ultimately is a really um, good deal. And the government does this because they want more people to be able to go to college that financially wouldn't be able to afford it. And so this is sort of a, a sweet deal, you could say, in, in giving that, that type of loan. Um, if you're more like my experience in college, it was an unsubsidized loan. Based on my family filling out the FAFSA, their family contribution was so high that they, the federal government said, yeah, you don't qualify for a subsidized loan. So what that means is the um, loans I took out as a freshman as in college, I had to pay the interest while I was a college student. And so this is a little bit different. These are more, more likely to occur. And so this is something you want to look into is if you qualify for subsidized loans, you should definitely take the subsidized loans. Awesome. And then one more thing, and this is just more um, specific, is if you do have a lower socioeconomic level, um, you can get what's called a federal Perkins loan. And so this specifically is where the federal government helps with the interest rate and oftentimes the school is um, the school is the one that is helping you with this, and so you can get a really low interest rate, usually of about five percent. And this would be the best loan. So, for example, maybe you take out a subsidized loan from the federal government, and then CSUN will give you a federal Perkins loan to pay the rest of it, and it's a very low interest rate. Again, all of these are opportunities to allow more and more people to go to college, but you don't want to. Uh, get into a situation where you're incurring so much debt uh, that you'll never be able to pay it back. One more thing that you can do as far as uh, paying for college is what's called federal work study. And so what this means is you get a job on campus and they're, they're pretty sweet gigs. You basically get to do your homework for a lot of them while you're working. And uh, so you could be like a front aid desk, uh, like in the registrar, or the library or financial aid. And basically the money that you would earn as a um, as like a, a wage, that money would go towards your uh, your tuition. So let's say that you were to make you know a couple hundred dollars a week. That couple hundred dollars, instead of going in your pocket, would go and pay towards the, the tuition. So we're paying it, and this is the last part of this: is really understand that when you do take out this amount of money for college, you are going to eventually have to pay it back. And so the way you pay it back ultimately can impact how much money you pay over time. If you take 30 years to pay off your student loans, you're going to pay thousands and thousands of dollars more than you would have if you would have paid it off in 10 years. And so one way that you can do this is a standard repayment plan where it's the same amount. So you pay, let's say, $50 the first month of the first year. That last payment of that 10th year is still going to be $50. So it's $50 for the next 10 years. Whereas a graduated repayment plan, and this is what I am actually enrolled in, is the graduated repayment plan is where you do lower at first. So I didn't have a high paying job or any really paying job at all out of college. And so I had very low uh, loan payments and now getting closer to the 10 year, I pay much, much more, but I make more money. So it's not a problem. So I do the graduated repayment. So a last uh, kind of concept here is what if you can't pay? Well, you can defer your loans. And this is something I actually did in the Peace Corps is after I graduated college, I deferred my loans. And so I didn't have to make any loan payments for two years while I was in the Peace Corps. I paid the interest because it still accrued interest, but I didn't have to actually pay the loan payments. So to say this a different way, based on four years of college and two years of the Peace Corps, I effectively did not have to pay my loans for two years or six years. So that, that was, that was a, a benefit of being in something like the Peace Corps is I didn't have to pay loans. And then you could also go into what's called forbearance. So if you can't, if you lose your job or you don't have any money to pay, you can ask the federal government for forbearance, which means that you don't have to pay for an extended period of time, usually for 12 months, but your credit score is going to really take a hit. Okay. 
So thanks for listening, guys. I know a lot of this information is, is kind of dry, but I just wanted to give you a general overview. Go ahead and make sure that your notes um, line up with the PowerPoint, and then we'll make sure to go over this in class and answer any questions that you guys have.